When contemplating the Fermi paradox and confronting the are we alone question, the tendency has always been to focus on the very big solutions to the question of why it is, when we look into the heavens, we see no good evidence thus far of the presence of alien civilizations. We look out and we simply see nothing but the hand of nature and an immense loneliness in the galaxy. These big picture solutions run from such weighty propositions as all civilizations going extinct shortly after they hit technology without exception, to alien civilizations being exceedingly rare for some unknown reason, to the zoo hypothesis and variants where aliens are intentionally not revealing themselves to us but are nonetheless in control. It must be said, many of these solutions are anthropocentric. We base them on what we do. But we have no idea if aliens would do what we do. But there is also a class of solutions that have nothing to do with our activities, but instead the whims of nature itself. This is where the paradox becomes exceedingly complicated, because biology is exceedingly complicated. What's not yet well explored within the paradox are the little biological details that might seem small and inconsequential at first, but end up telescoping through to become viable, outright hard solutions to the paradox. The apparent general scarcity of phosphorus in the galaxy being an example. This particular solution, however, is obscure. I've never come across it in any of the literature. It's just something I've been thinking about, so I'll advance it here. Before I get to it, though, there is a solution like it that also isn't well known. It involves a quirk of abiogenesis. Life on Earth isn't actually the only genetic material on this planet. While life is life, there is also a kind of quasi-life that is also genetically based. And it's the viruses. It's unclear at this point what exactly caused the viruses to appear. They just seemed to appear right at the same time life did on Earth, some 3.7 billion years ago or more. Some suspect that the viruses actually somehow predate life as we know it. But is that a guaranteed state of affairs in the universe? That the advent of microbial life would also see the co-advent of viruses? There doesn't seem to be much of a reason to suspect that this would be guaranteed. And it may be the case that the reason for life on Earth existing as it does is because of some pressure put on it by the existence of viruses that may not happen often on other worlds. Add that with the fact that intelligent, highly technological life has only developed once in the history of this world, out of millions of species past and present, and you have a completely viable solution to the paradox. There you could say microbial life is common in the universe, but it is rarely pressured by viruses. It may remain simple without them, and when it is pressured and evolves even more complexity, there's no guarantee that it will ever achieve technological intelligence. A great silence indeed in that case. But what effect did viruses have on the evolutionary process on Earth? There is some thinking that they were a major contributor in a number of ways. It seems that viruses introduced genetic information into biology, to the point that they have helped shape the genomes of life on Earth. Tiny exchanges of genetic information, but also, well, pandemics rushing through nature changing the landscape, seem to have contributed greatly to how species evolve, at least to a degree. So viruses may well be one of the major drivers of evolution, but they are not the only ones. It pays to remember that random mutations, symbiosis situations, and natural selection also play roles. So a lack of viruses may not be a showstopper for complex life on exoplanets just a factor that happened here. But hidden within the question of viruses is something that might actually be a showstopper for technological intelligence. The question here is based on a recent paper by Tene Ghosh and colleagues, link in the description below, about a substance known as myelin, essentially the mix of proteins and lipids needed to insulate nerve axons, not unlike the insulation on an electrical wire, though even more important. Myelin's main function is to insulate the nerve axon to allow for significantly faster transmission of electrical impulses, on the order of a hundred times faster than without myelin. And indeed, not all nerves in the body have it. For those that do, the coating also allows for nerve fibers to be thinner and much longer than without, which allows for a far more efficient nervous system and speed, evolutionarily speaking, allows you to react fast and chase prey, or run away if you are prey much more efficiently. 
These are integral in humans. Terrible health issues arise when something is wrong with a normal myelin sheathing process, usually through neurodegenerative autoimmune diseases. But how did the all-important myelin sheath come to be? Well, in jawed vertebrates, it came down to luck. Remnants of retrovirus genetics have been found in jawed vertebrates that actually activate the production of a specific protein needed for myelin. This in turn may have allowed the evolution of complex, fast brains in vertebrates such as humans. Oddly, it was not a one-off occurrence, however. The same trick has been seen to have occurred in multiple species of jawed vertebrates, as though some kind of convergent evolution was happening. Perhaps this virus or virus type were infecting multiple species, all leading to the same result. I stress the word jawed, however. Retroviruses are strange in and of themselves. They are RNA viruses, but they can make DNA copies of themselves and embed their genetics into their host. Very rarely this can be incorporated as a permanent feature and then be passed down through offspring. Up until relatively recently, these weird splices were thought to just be junk DNA, known as retrotransposons. But more recent work shows that they actually are not junk and originate from retroviruses and come with the implication of having dramatically affected evolution on Earth. It may very well be the case that without this, we wouldn't be here. There are other areas where the hand of retroviruses are seen, including the evolution of the immune system. It's also seen in the evolution of the placenta and now myelin. The situation with retroviruses is starting to seem very important indeed, if not downright spooky. We're dealing with the viruses here, one of the banes of human existence. Smallpox, Ebola, rabies. Yet without the viruses, we might not exist. We are seeing their fingerprints in an increasing number of places in human evolution. It's now to the point that it appears that had the ability to produce and sheath long axons and myelin might not have evolved, our complex brains wouldn't have developed either, nor would the massive diversity of vertebrates have happened. It would have all been more confined, both making it unlikely anything like a human would have ever developed, all enabled by an ancient virus that appeared in infected vertebrate animals about the time when jaws appear in evolutionary history. But the strange thing here is that the RNA itself, the gene sequence is termed retromyelin, doesn't actually have the instructions to make the required protein. It's non-coding. Rather, it only works as a kind of catalyst in tandem with a completely different protein, SOX10. And that coupling is what somehow turns on the myelin protein production in myelin producing cells in the central nervous system called oligodendrocytes. That's weird. And it's the first time that type of interaction with non-coding RNA sequences has been noted in the study of retrotransposons, though something similar to it has been seen. Once that protein is produced, known as the myelin basic protein, it can then complete the zipping up of the myelin sheath around a nerve fiber. Oddly though, it is actually left incomplete in that the myelin is segmented and actually has tiny gaps between the segments where the nerve is actually bare. Experiments were done using fish, frogs, and rodents to reduce the effect of the retromyelin in myelin-producing cells, and as a result, production of the basic myelin protein dropped dramatically. It was also found that this situation seems very common among all vertebrates. The invertebrates do not have this, however, but even stranger, neither do the jawless vertebrates like the lampreys. This suggests that whatever happened here, happened well after the last common ancestor of the jawed vertebrates. This would in turn suggest a scenario where perhaps at some point, retroviruses infected multiple species of vertebrate, all producing the same outcome. But apparently, the jawless vertebrates were immune to the virus. Or they lost the genetics involved because it wasn't useful for them. This is all very strange indeed, and the paper doesn't go quite this far, but I will. This all starts to resemble a solution to the Fermi paradox, in that there is no guarantee that viruses will co-evolve with life in the first place, and you just get an exoplanet with only cellular life with no viruses. Then maybe the complex magic of complex evolution doesn't occur for lack of a need to. Indeed, large-scale complex evolution may never happen on such an exoplanet, or it may move very, very slowly. If this is the case for most of the universe, then it's frankly no wonder we appear to be alone. 
The circumstances of the myelin problem alone would potentially present a great filter, much less the no doubt many solutions to the paradox that may lie within what we thought until recently was junk DNA, retrotransposons. In the end, it would mean that intelligence could be expected to be, quite simply, very, very rare. Not for reasons of environment per se, but a chance, situational, physical, chemical property that happens with DNA and proteins. Intelligence still would not be impossible. It likely still exists elsewhere and elsewhere, just because of the sheer numbers involved, but the chances of it being nearby are astronomically low. But that's not where it stops. There are more layers of troubles in this solution. It would also require that whatever alien viruses that might arise along with life on an exoplanet would need the genetic capability to reach the outcome it did here. But there is absolutely no guarantee of that, and the vast majority of viruses on Earth do not have this feature. Even if it did have it, there's no guarantee the organism it's infecting will incorporate the genetic material, or could incorporate it, much like the lampreys appear not to have done. So not only do you need retroviruses existing on your planet, you need them to be compatible with the host in a fairly specific way. The Great Silence is starting to make a bit more sense, isn't it? And then there is yet another layer. With this, again, you have that weird sort of symbiotic relationship the RNA has with a specific protein to bring about the manufacturing of a totally different protein rather than a direct set of genetic instructions. This does not seem very likely to happen much. It isn't even direct biology, but a lucky chemical chance trick. If the scenario is correct, this may end up being one of the most solid solutions to the Fermi Paradox. I often get commenters saying, oh JMG, you just want to find alien life, you want to believe. But Earth could be rare, or we could be completely alone in the universe. Well, what I really want to know is, is life unique, or is it everywhere, including the microbes? I have found very few ways to back up a claim of a rare Earth, or an alone humanity. There's just nothing in science that fully supports those viewpoints. But here I present a solution that could result in very rare technological terrestrial intelligence based on a physical barrier. I leave oceanic intelligence out of this, as it works on somewhat different rules. But good luck smelting metal if you're an octopus, intelligent invertebrate though you may be. Of course, however, regarding anything with the paradox, until you actually see an alien civilization, you can't prove anything. Not seeing anything isn't enough. Absence of evidence does not mean evidence of absence. You might be able to prove a biosphere, however. Those may be common. But if we see biosphere after biosphere in the galaxy with no technosignatures, then these biological great filter type solutions will need to be looked at very carefully. We very likely don't know about all of them yet. But in fairness, all you need is one unambiguous technosignature and all of this is out the window. But as with any good solution to the Fermi Paradox, there is a wild card. That the myelin sheath development appears to have happened independently among many different jawed vertebrate groups raises an eyebrow. There may be an aspect to this that we are unaware of that might make it simpler than it initially appears. But an even bigger one is that certain invertebrates, such as some of the crustaceans, also have a type of nerve sheathing. Here they are myelin-like, not exactly, and are functionally equivalent, but almost certainly evolved through very different means. Oddly, certain species of shrimp, with this alternative myelin substitute system, actually can have faster conducting nerves than a human does, so there is that. So the Achilles heel of this solution as a great filter that I can identify is that once again, some kind of convergent evolution seems to have happened with how nerve cells conduct in Earth's life. But not in all animals. There are plenty of species that have no sheath at all, and their evolution is restricted by it. Nor do all nerves in the human nervous system have it. So it may well be that there are other alien civilizations, but they bear a nervous system more like that of a shrimp than a human. And with faster conduction, they might think more efficiently than we do. And it also has to be left open whether there are other possible ways to have some kind of equivalent to a nervous system that an alien species might evolve that looks nothing like anything on Earth. Earth, with all its diversity of life, does not host all that is thought to be possible in biology, and also what we haven't even thought of yet. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently inviting comments on this solution. 
Fermi Paradox people, shoot me down, debate, discuss, and let's explore this idea further, shall we? And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.